emotional suppression gets a bad rap, especially from psychologists like me who should know better. But far from the kind of boogeyman that it's made out to be, emotional suppression is actually a really useful tool for emotional health and resilience. The key is to know what emotional suppression really is and how to do it well. What is emotional suppression exactly? There are a lot of technical definitions for emotional suppression out there, but the gist of it is this. Emotional suppression means deciding to ignore an emotion. For instance, let's say you are at work and you're walking into a big meeting when you see a text from one of your siblings and the text leads you to feel really angry and upset and kind of hurt. In that moment, you decide to deliberately suppress your anger and hurt feelings so that you can go into the meeting that you have to lead and do a good job doing that. Notice how this suppression of emotion is a deliberate choice. Now that's important because it distinguishes emotional suppression from a related but very different concept of emotional repression. Repression is when you unconsciously suppress or ignore difficult emotions. And it should be obvious that there's a pretty huge difference between making a deliberate choice to suppress an emotion and just unconsciously or habitually doing it anytime you feel difficult emotions. In the case of the example I just used above, the benefits of immediately stopping and processing your anger there, and as a result, uh, I don't know, blowing off your meeting or not being focused on the meeting because you're thinking about your anger the whole time, they probably don't outweigh those downsides. Now, the other critical distinction here is that with emotional suppression, it's a temporary response. So you could imagine a situation where, again, you're sort of walking in the meeting, you feel upset, you suppress that emotion, and then after the meeting, you decide to, I don't know, go for a walk around the park for 20 minutes and really mull over what happened and how you're feeling and all that. Or maybe you decide, okay, this evening after I get home from work, I'm going to spend 20 minutes journaling about the incident and how it made me feel. So when used well, emotional suppression acts as a sort of bridging mechanism that allows you to defer processing an emotion until there's a more optimal time later. The important insight and implication here is that processing emotions immediately is not always the best decision. For one thing, processing the emotion immediately might interfere with something more important that you have to do in that moment. But the other way to think about this too is that often emotional processing itself is better done later on with a little bit of time and distance in between when it happened, when you initially experienced the emotion, and when you go to reflect on it and process it. This is especially true for anger. When we're initially upset by something and feeling really angry, we tend to get kind of impulsive and narrow-minded. Whereas after we've had time to kind of cool off, get a little distance, we're often able to think in a more calm and reflective, sort of balanced way about what happened, how we're feeling, and how we want to respond. Taking the example from before, if someone texted you and you got super angry all of a sudden, is that really the best headspace from which to reflect on and try and process that anger? I don't know. Maybe, right? You could make the case, for instance, that, well, it's important to do it right away because you might uh, forget something about what happened or how you were feeling. And so therefore processing right away um, would be important. Well, that could be the case, but just because there are benefits to processing right away doesn't mean those benefits are more important than the benefits that might come from processing later, from suppressing the emotion temporarily and then processing at a later, potentially more optimal time. So just because processing an emotion immediately has some benefits doesn't mean it's always the most helpful solution. I mean, if you think about it, again, using our example, you could imagine how if you tried to process it immediately, it might lead to you wanting to respond right away and doing so in a less than optimal way, maybe getting sarcastic back or sending something rude or unhelpful. On the other hand, if you suppress the emotion, gave yourself a little bit of time, and then came back to it and processed it from a better headspace, you might realize, um, say, that you misinterpreted something in the text and saved yourself from kind of compounding the issue with your own bad behavior in response. Too often, we default to immediately processing an emotion because we just want to get rid of the emotion and not have to feel it anymore. But there's nothing inherently good or bad about immediately processing an emotion. And similarly, there's nothing inherently good or bad about suppressing it temporarily and then returning to it later. Both have pros and cons, but it's your job to exercise some judgment and make a decision about whether it's more beneficial to process it immediately or suppress it and deal with it at a later time. Now, one more thing to think about here. In addition to emotions as messengers, like that's one dominant way to think about an emotion is that it's it's your brain trying to tell you something, right? The other thing that emotions do is they sort of nudge us or push us towards certain behaviors. So take the example of anxiety. Anxiety often pushes us to kind of worry or avoid things because the idea is your brain thinks it's dangerous. 
Similarly, anger often pushes us to act aggressively because there is some sort of injustice that needs to be corrected. That's what your brain's thinking anyway. Or sadness often pushes us to dwell on something. Now, a lot of times these behaviors can be helpful. If you are in a truly dangerous situation, that urging from anxiety or fear to avoid something can be really helpful, potentially life-saving. Similarly, that urging from sadness to dwell on something, that can help you reflect on and learn from a mistake so that it doesn't happen again in the future or it's less likely to happen again in the future. But at the same time, those impulses to act can also be destructive or harmful. Acting aggressively can actually lead to more aggression and then potentially guilt and remorse later on. Or dwelling on something, a mistake that happened, can lead to self-criticism and rumination, which are very, very unhelpful. So it's never black and white. The way to think about these emotions is not that they're good or bad. Instead, I think a better metaphor or way to think about emotions is emotions are like good friends. While they always have your best intentions at heart, that doesn't make them immune from giving you bad advice from time to time. And again, it's our job in the moment, depending on our goals, our values, the situation, to decide whether we want to take the advice that our emotions are giving us or temporarily sort of suppress them and ignore them and maybe return to them later. But of course, choosing to suppress our emotions or ignore them is not without its risks. Like any behavior, emotional expression is not without its risks and potential downsides. In fact, I think one of the reasons people are borderline paranoid about not suppressing emotions is because they intuit, at least on some level, that it can be a very slippery slope, right? It starts off where you're just suppressing an emotion um, with the full intention to return to it later and process it more fully. But, you know, one thing leads to another, we're busy, whatever, we didn't really get to it. And we tell ourselves, oh, we'll get to it later. But later turns into another later and another later, and eventually we just never do it. Now, this habit starts to become more common. And pretty soon, we're suppressing things regularly over and over again to the point where this becomes like a default coping mechanism anytime we feel bad. We just suppress and suppress and ignore and ignore. Now, emotional suppression has become, it's almost morphed into repression, which remember is an unconscious habit of just shoving stuff under the rug and never dealing with it again, which obviously can be very problematic. Now, the reason this particular slope is so slippery is because emotional suppression can be very rewarding. It can feel very good because it gives us immediate, instantaneous relief from often some pretty difficult, painful emotions like anxiety or sadness or shame, something like that. And like any behavior that leads to immediate, intense relief from painful feeling, think drugs and alcohol, for instance, it can be very addicting. In other words, it can get easy to become addicted to emotional suppression because it's so rewarding. And this in itself should definitely give us pause when we're thinking about emotional suppression. It doesn't invalidate it as a strategy, but we should definitely be careful and thoughtful with it. Now, if you're unsure about whether to suppress an emotion or not, here are a few questions you can kind of ask yourself to suss that out a little bit. The first is, what's my motivation? Now, often, if your motivation is, Ugh, I just don't want to feel this anymore, I want to get rid of it. So in other words, if your motivation is to escape from painful feeling, if that's the primary motivation, that's often a sign that suppression would not be a good idea. On the other hand, if your motivation is to accomplish something more important with the full intent to get back to processing the emotion later, if need be, that's a pretty good indicator that yes, it's probably okay to go through with it. Next, you wanna ask yourself, do I have a plan? <laughs> so this is a really good check for uh, healthy suppression. If you have a plan for when you're gonna return to process or think more about or consider that emotion, that's a good sign. On the other hand, if you're doing it so impulsively and instinctively that you haven't even given yourself a second to think through, what am I actually gonna do about this later on? Again, that might give you a little pause. And then the third thing you wanna ask yourself is, does, is the direction this emotion is pushing me, does that align with my values? So if your emotions are pushing you toward a behavior that doesn't align with your values, like for instance, sending a super sarcastic text back to your sibling who sent you a mean text, that conflicts with your values. So you might want to take some time, suppress it initially, and then come back to it and revisit it later. On the other hand, if the emotion aligns super well with something you know to be good and helpful, then I think going with it uh, makes more sense. Now at this point, there is a risk that we have fallen into thinking about emotional suppression in slightly kind of black and white terms. Either like you suppress an emotion and then maybe deal with it later, or you don't, you just deal with it right away. 
in reality, there's sort of a middle class of responding to emotions that I think is really helpful to talk about. Emotional processing versus emotional validation. Now, processing or emotional processing, it's one of those kind of annoyingly ambiguous terms that psychologists and mental health professionals like to use, but rarely take the time to actually you know, define and talk about what it means. And while I'm not aware of any kind of technical definition for um, emotional processing, it basically means making time to carefully reflect on how you're feeling. Now, there are two kind of key features of emotional processing. The first is reflection. You are thinking carefully and intentionally about what you're feeling. It's not impulsive or like a gut reaction. You're considering it from multiple viewpoints. You're thinking about its meaning. You're acknowledging how it relates to other parts of your experience, like your beliefs or your values or even your body. So reflection um, is really a key part of emotional processing. The second one is time. Emotional processing takes some time. It doesn't necessarily take, you know, years or months or hours even necessarily, but you probably can't process a difficult emotion in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, so maybe you want to spend 45 minutes chatting with your spouse or a good friend about some difficult emotional experience. That might be a way to process your emotion, right? Or you spend I don't know, even just 15 or 20 minutes journaling about something that could also be a really um, effective way to process a difficult emotion. Of course, not all difficult emotions need to be processed at all. If you're driving down the freeway and someone cuts you off and you feel, I don't know, mildly annoyed, I don't think you need to schedule like an emergency therapy session with your counselor. Right? In fact, I would argue the vast majority of difficult emotions we experience probably don't need any further processing. We just, we experience them. That's, you know, it's, a, it's tough and we move on. So while there's a whole class and set of emotions that don't need any sort of further processing, um, there's also this middle class of emotional experiences that I think don't require full-blown processing, like extended periods of reflection, but could benefit from a little more attention than simply ignoring them and never coming back to them. And this is where validation comes in. So to validate an emotion means to remind yourself that just because something feels bad doesn't mean it is bad or that you're bad for feeling it. Going back to the example of the nasty text while you're walking into a meeting, while you're literally walking through the door into the meeting, you might just say something to yourself as simple as, you know what? I'm feeling a little angry and sad about that text. I don't like feeling this way, but it's okay. And it makes sense that I would feel this way. Like anyone would feel upset um, if they got that text from their sibling. Now, a few things to notice here about this little bit of emotional validation. The first is, again, it's very brief. <laughs> like you could do this in five seconds. This should not take very long. Number two is labeling. You're clearly labeling your emotions. You're saying, I'm sad, I feel angry. What you're doing is helping to kind of organize and tidy up your inner experience, your sort of inner landscape, if you will. And this really helps it um, to prevent it from becoming overwhelming. Okay, so it can kind of take the edge off the intensity of it, just labeling. And then of course, the third part is the validation itself, which the, the validation, it's right there in the name. You are just reminding yourself that something is valid no matter how it feels. It's okay to feel angry. Uh, most people would feel angry in a situation like this. You're not denying the emotion. You're just reminding yourself that it's, it's okay and it makes sense. Now, this validation is especially helpful um, really for two reasons, I think. The first is simply, it just kind of helps take the edge off the intensity of the emotion itself. It doesn't feel quite so bad once you acknowledge it and validate it. But B, it signals to your brain that this difficult feeling, it's not bad or dangerous because you're validating, you're approaching it, which signals safety. So your brain learns, okay, there's this thing, it's uncomfortable, this feeling, but it's not bad or dangerous. And in the long run, this actually makes you more confident and resilient dealing with difficult emotions like that in the future. So if you do decide to suppress or ignore an emotion, either entirely or just until you can um, you know, process it at a later time, it can't hurt to briefly sort of acknowledge those feelings and validate them. All you need to know, emotional suppression is not a dirty word. In fact, it's a perfectly legitimate and actually very healthy way to respond to difficult emotions sometimes. Of course, like any tool, it can be used poorly depending on the circumstances and your goals, but really that's no reason to vilify it or think of it as a bad thing that you need to be kind of scared of. After all, thinking too much about your emotions can be just as problematic as thinking too little about them. Obsession and repression both turn out poorly. So to wrap things up, if you're faced with a difficult emotion and you're unsure of how to handle it, here are a few key things to remember. First, much of the time, it's perfectly fine to ignore an emotion, especially if it's relatively mild. Two, 
In some situations, it makes sense to temporarily suppress or ignore the emotion so that you can come back to it at a more optimal time for further sort of processing and reflection. Third, when in doubt, you can always very briefly just build up this little habit of acknowledging and validating whatever you're feeling, whether or not you choose to come back to it later or not. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful and you want to get more tips and ideas from me, I write a free weekly newsletter called The Friendly Mind, where I share my newest articles, essays, podcasts, videos, stuff like that every Monday morning. And I would love to have you be part of our community. So feel free to join. There's a link in the description below. Thanks.